Well, welcome to the 5 p.m. service at St. Andrew the Great. My name's Craig, I'm one of the staff members here, and whether you're a church member or a friend who's been invited along who wouldn't normally be able to join us, or you've just stumbled across us via social media or being passed the link down a chain of friends, it is really, really great to have everyone with us. Uh, our time together will last about an hour. We're going to do a combination of things. We're going to hear from some different people in different churches around the country. Uh, we're going to pray. We're going to sing some songs together. And we're going to hear God's word read from the Bible and then explained to us, preached to us by Robbie, another member of staff. I think that's all there is to say. There's nothing you need particularly, though if you do have a Bible to hand later on, that would be useful. Uh, if you get the, uh, the service sheets emailed to you, then you could pull that up. Uh, on another device or print it out and you can follow the running order uh, but don't worry if you don't have any of those things everything will come up on the screen we're going to sing our first song together courtesy of uh, some of our church family who have been very kind enough to record it for us and it's a great song which reminds us why it is that we praise God because his name is holy and because of all the things he's done for us even though uh, we're not let's sing together Just the Lord of oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. up is a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, and we can sing Oh 
before we're going to hear from uh, some friends in another church now we call them our mission partners people that we partner with in different ways uh, to support the ministry that they're doing away from Cambridge uh, Ian Somersundrum uh, is the minister there and you might not know him or where the church is so we asked him if he would introduce himself and tell us a little bit about what he's doing hello we're Ian and Helen Somersundrum with Aaron Joshua and Daniel ages nine seven and four we lead two churches in South Tyneside, the main one being St John's in Heaven. We've been here for nearly five years, three and a half for curacy, and the last bit with Ian as vicar. We're building on a foundation of evangelical style ministry, strengthening gospel convictions and biblical discipleship. It's a working class area, um, that's a joy, and it's also full of challenges. So I'm just sitting uh, across from the town centre behind me. Uh, we love it here in Heaven. Um, it's a very friendly place. The, the mines and the shipyards are long gone. But lots of people are in low paid work and it's still a very traditional close knit community of traditional values and uh, values of uh, views of church and God are very traditional as well. Of course, it's not the same God as the God of the Bible, but uh, work is a fragile thing for many people. Domestic violence is a big thing. Um, alcohol abuse, um, health is not good for many people, mental health is a big problem too. Of course what people most need is the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ and the hope that comes with that especially in these times. Here in the building just before lockdown we had a vision day with a guest speaker and this helped us to think about church being less about activities and events and more about relationships around the Bible and being disciples and now we can't run all those activities. It seems providential that we've been forced in this direction. Many are relating to each other in a deeper way online and by phone. Online church has helped some engage with the Bible in a fresh way. But there are older folk who aren't engaged at all and um, please pray for our children's work that what we do will engage them and for parents to disciple them well at home we're really thankful for both the local gospel partnership and uh, the renew group in this region which have uh, started to take off in the last year or so which is really great and it means that several at st john's are considering the local ministry training course and our prayer is that with more workers we uh, should grow and, and be able to plant more churches in our local area because there's so few churches preaching the bible uh, and the gospel of the lord jesus christ so thank you for your support it means a lot to us the ways that you do that and, and thank you for your prayers we're going to sing again now and this is a really brilliant song if you're new to our services or if you're still thinking about uh, the Christian faith because it explains just some of the things that Christians believe. Um, it's called a creed where we sing truths to one another and it's great for those of us who are Christians as well because it reminds us of all the things that we have in our relationship with God. Father everlasting, the all-creating one, God Almighty. Through your Holy Spirit, conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus the Savior. I believe in God the Father. I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again, for I believe in the name of Jesus.
We're going to pray together now. And uh, one of the good things about being a Christian and a Christian family together is that we can pray to God at any time. Even though we're isolated and separated from one another, uh, the Christian is never separated from God. And so we can talk to him at all times and he hears our prayers and promises to answer them. Naomi's going to lead us in prayer and I thought I'd let her introduce herself to us all. Hi, my name's Naomi and I'm a graduate student studying for an MPhil in Polar Studies. I've been so grateful over this time for focused studies in Jonah and Habakkuk and what we've seen of God's grace and justice. I've also been really encouraged by the girls in the group who've been such a support and encouragement at this time. Let's pray together. We'll start with a prayer of confession which will come up on your screen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have gone our own way and have not loved you as we should, nor loved our neighbours as ourselves. We have failed to do those things that we should have done, and we have done what we should not have done. We have broken your commands and rightly deserve your condemnation. Father, we are truly sorry. For the sake of Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past. By your spirit, turn back our hearts to love you and to love our neighbours. Help us to live godly and obedient lives for your honour and glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear these wonderful words of grace from 1 Corinthians 6. You were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of our God. Dear Heavenly Father, how majestic is your name in all the earth. When we consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, and the moon and the stars which you have set in place, we marvel at the fact that you are mindful of us and that you care for us. Father, we glorify you for the ways in which you have provided for us in this time. We thank you for the privilege it is to have your word accessible to us in our own language that we can receive teaching, and that we are able to meet virtually to encourage one another. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the work you are doing through Ian, Helen, Aaron, Joshua and Daniel at St John's Heaven. We praise you that those on the fringes and newer members are making the most of technology to get involved regularly. Thank you for the children's work they've been able to do online, and we pray for creative ideas and that the parents would engage and be seeking to disciple their children well. We praise you for the Renew Group and those considering going into full-time ministry in the area. Lord, please direct them in your paths and may the good news of love and grace be very fruitful in heaven. We ask that all those in the St John's Church family 
would grow together in unity to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head and that they would grow in love and fear of you at this time. Lord, we ask the same for us today as Robbie speaks on imitating your example of humility. We pray that our hearts would burn as we meet with you. Would we be convicted of our pride and self-righteousness and look to you for increased passion to serve those around us? May we be motivated out of a fresh astonishment at your boundless grace, that you were willing to humble yourself to be constrained in a human body, and not only that, but also to suffer under the righteous anger of God against our sin. We are so thankful, Lord Jesus, that you are our good shepherd, and that you have called us to be your sheep. Help us to hear and obey your voice. But Lord, even when we are weak, disobedient and lazy, thank you that your purposes to bring grace and justice to all nations will prevail, as we've been encouraged of in focus group studies in Jonah and Habakkuk. And so, looking further afield, we pray for your world. We especially cry out to you for all those in refugee camps, like the Malakasa camp in Greece, where cramped conditions have increased vulnerability to and fear of the virus. Sovereign God, full of love, justice and grace, we know that nothing is impossible for you, and we ask that you protect these people from further devastation. We praise you for all those willing to endanger themselves for the good of others, and we ask that you bless those in decision-making positions with great wisdom. May your will be done in this situation, and may many come to put their hope in you. O God, the King of glory, who exalted your only Son, Jesus Christ, with great triumph to your kingdom in heaven. Do not leave us desolate, but send your Holy Spirit to strengthen and exalt us to the place where our Saviour Christ has gone before, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever. Amen. Well, if prayer is speaking to God, and that's open to all people, and then the Bible is the word of God. It's how he speaks to us and he can speak to all people as well. And so as we have our passage read to us this evening and then Robbie, our students, curate, come and preach it to us. Uh, know that, that God speaks to us through his word, whoever we are and whatever we say we believe. Uh, Sarah, a member of our congregation, is going to read the passage to us and then Robbie will appear to preach it to us. I asked Sarah if she would just introduce herself and then she will point us in the right direction from there. Hi, I'm Sarah and I work on potato research. Um, today's passage is Philippians 2 verses 1 to 11. So, Philippians 2 verses 1 to 11. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being in one spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility values others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place, and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Dear Father, thank you for your word to us today. Please be with Robbie as he preaches, and give us soft and teachable hearts that are willing to change. In Jesus' name, Amen. Hey friends, my name's Robbie. Let me add my welcome. It's lovely to, um, to see you. Thanks for joining us. It'll be help for you to keep the passage open. Um, we're going to spend a bit of time looking at Philippians chapter 2. We're better together. That's a bit of a catchphrase, isn't it? It's the kind of thing that you hear like workplaces talk about on those team building days or like a sports team or whatever. We're stronger and better together. 
And it's become a bit of a catchphrase of the whole um, coronavirus pandemic as well, hasn't it? We're all in this together. Um, even kind of supermarkets and, and companies have gone in on the act in terms of their advertising and their branding. I saw it in Tesco's the other day, just by the checkouts, like we're all in this together. It's why when it feels like we're not in stuff together, it becomes a particularly hollow and, and hard phrase to hear whether it's the virus and the difference between kind of north and south or rich and poor, actually maybe we're not all in this together in quite the way we think we are. Or whether it's in a church, because the church is also better together, but sometimes just like in our nation, fracture lines appear in Christian communities, power plays or factions or cliques. There's certainly hints of that in um, the church in Philippi, which Paul is writing to. Now, let, me, let me just get one thing out of the way. We're not preaching this little passage because we feel on the staff team that there's some particular kind of issues or factions in the church that we need to deal with. No, not, not at all. It's just that we're going through Philippians and this is where we've come to. But certainly, whenever you get any group of people together, particularly as Christians, we know that we are sinners saved by grace. Whenever you get any sinners together in some kind of group, then there's going to be friction, isn't there? If you live with others, um, uh, perhaps a family or, or you kind of got housemates or something and you've been kind of locked in together over the last few weeks and months, then maybe you'll have been feeling some of that kind of friction and, and tension. And it's the same with church family. That's what Paul's writing to address. Now, if you wouldn't consider yourself a Christian, maybe you've even had a very bad experience of, of, of church family, a divisive church family you're looking into church, whatever, you're very, very welcome. And I hope that this will be helpful for you as you kind of think a little bit about what church is and what is right at the very heart of the Christian faith. We've been reading through this lockdown letter and Paul writes it from a prison cell. And it's a letter that is saturated with the gospel. It is full of the joy of being in Jesus Christ, this letter. It changes Paul's circumstance in prison and he wants it to change the Philippians' attitude to absolutely everything. Verse uh, 27 of chapter 1 gives us a bit of a headline for this section that we're in. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Let it fill up everything inside you. And he particularly wants that to cash out in terms of the Philippian church's unity. They are better together. United in the face of opposition, that's what we saw a couple of weeks ago. But more than that, unity is just right at the heart of what the church should be. That's the first thing I think we see in verses 1 and 2. If you are a Christian, you will be a team player. It's just natural. Look at verse 1 and 2. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. See what he's saying, verse 2? Think the same as each other. Be united, one spirit, one mind. Do you see all, all the mind words? He wants to get inside their heads to change their very attitudes to one another. This unity, this focus on the team and not the individual, is crucial. Now, it might sound overly cerebral or kind of heady, but think more in terms of attitude or, or mindset. This is not just a theory. It'll cash out into action, and, and we'll see that a bit later on. But first, you see how he bases this appeal for unity in all the blessings of being a Christian. There's four ifs in verse one. Did you see them? They're not ifs of uncertainty. The assumption is that Paul is saying these are things, these are precisely the things that the Christian in Philipp Christians in Philippi have experienced. So let's take them in turn. If, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, which you have, he's saying. Yeah, any relationship with Christ, any forgiveness of sins, any sense that there's some kind of intimacy and closeness, like that relationship between a husband and wife. If you have any comfort in his love, which you have if you're a Christian. In Jesus, we are loved in spite of what we've done and nothing can separate us from that love. 
if you have any sharing in the Spirit, which you have. The Holy Spirit who comes to dwell inside Christians, who draws us together as a church, who helps us to fight sin. Yeah, we don't always win that battle. It's a struggle day by day, but there's the desire there to change that has only been put there by the Spirit. And then if you have any tenderness and compassion, which you have. Some people think this is describing the experience of the kind of Christian community, like tenderness and compassion amongst each other. But I think actually that it's like the other three, something that God has done for us. I think it's talking about a divine blessing. The tenderness and compassion, these are words that are often used in the Bible to talk about the heart of God towards sufferers and sinners. So think of tenderness. It's the characteristic word for God's mercy. He doesn't treat us as our sins deserve. Instead, he gently and kindly comes alongside us with the loving embrace of a father for a long lost son. Or think of compassion. It's the word used in the gospels. When Jesus has compassion on the crowds, it's a kind of gut-wrenching word. Literally, his heart goes out to them. So if you've experienced any of those blessings, if you know just something of the comforts of being a Christian, that, 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 if you know just a little thing about the amazing love of God for you in Jesus Christ, if you are a Christian, then, verse 2, be united, be a team player. It, it's a natural overflow of what God has already done for us in Christ. Do you see, verse 2, how the word love is repeated? So if you have any comfort from his love, verse 1, then make my joy complete by having the same love. As in the same love that God has shown for you, that's the love to bend out towards others. It's what God has done, what he's like towards us, that undergirds what we are to be like towards others. So the big take home, I guess, is that Christians have to be team players. It's just instinctive. You, you cannot be a Rambo Christian who kind of goes in there, guns blazing, does it all on his own or her own. Why? Well, one reason is because if you're on your own, you cannot bend out to others what you have received from God. We're to be united, one in spirit and in mind. If you're a Christian, you are a team player. Now, I think some of this team playing stuff is a bit harder with social distancing. We're not socially distant, by the way, that's a terrible phrase. We're physically distant from one another. But in many ways, it's easy to live now and turn in on ourselves as if we actually are socially or even spiritually distant from one another, not just to self-isolate, but to spiritually isolate, like a kind of tortoise that sucks its head back into its shell. I found that, I don't know if you have, whether it's living on your own and you're discovering, discovering the kind of inner introvert that actually kind of quite likes ignoring people's texts and just hunkering down in front of Netflix on your own. Or whether you're with family or kind of groups of friends and you're kind of quite content in your own little social bubbles, fine with the people I know, but too scared to join anything at church that might involve a random breakout room, goodness. But even though we're physically distant from one another, the natural instinct of a Christian is going to be to reach out to others, to join in the team, because that's what God has done for us in Christ. So stay connected with church during this time. We, we need others and others need us. If you're a Christian, you're going to be a team player. That's the kind of main thrust of Philippians chapter 2. And in the next few verses, Paul fleshes it out a little bit more. He gives us the how of, of, of being a team player and the why. So the how first, value the interests of others. Look at verse three and four. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Humility is gonna be the key requirement, the key ingredient in this team. And it makes total sense, doesn't it? Pride ruins teams. You think of the player who never passes the ball or, or the co-worker who dominates a project or kind of doesn't pull their weight. 
Humility is defined by Paul both negatively and positively in verses 3 and 4. Negatively, verse 3, nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Now, these verses are pretty searching, aren't they? We all know, I think, within us, that instinct towards selfish ambition, the, the rivalry or comparison game, the instinct to connect every conversation or experience with us and, and our own experiences. Conceit means just excessive pride in, in yourself, a desire for glory, for the world to revolve around me. But it's an empty glory, did you see? Like vain conceit. Because the world does not revolve around me. In some ways, pride actually is the root cause of every sin. That's the negative, nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. But the positive, value others above yourselves. In an elitist Roman culture like it was in, in Philippi, it has this idea of rank. Consider others of a higher rank than you are. Notice what he doesn't say in Philippians. He doesn't say, instead of being proud, kind of look down on yourself. Humility is not some kind of self depreciation or, or debasement. Because it's, it's funny how pride can sometimes be flipped around, especially in more Christian circles, I guess. We want the glory of being seen to be humble. So, you know, you have that conversation with somebody, oh, I've just started like a new online hobby. I'm, I'm learning to knit online or something random like that. I don't know. And the person says, oh, me too. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm really good at knitting. I've been knitting for ages and let me show you all the things I've been knitting. Like, I love knitting. I'm really, really good at knitting. Like, that's an obvious kind of pride, isn't it? It's a bit less obvious, though, when the response is, oh, I could never do knitting. You know, I, I'm terrible at that. I've, I've got no time for hobbies. Like, my fingers are too fat. I don't know. It's a different kind of response. But the focus there is still on self and not on other. As the writer Tim Keller says, the essence of a gospel humility is not thinking more of myself or, or less of myself, it's just thinking of myself less. Humility values others above self. And that is made very practical in verse 4. Look, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Again, there's the negative, positive thing. As one preacher says, interest is a kind of fill in the blanks word. You could put anything in there in place of it. So, so not looking to your own financial security or happiness or family goals or comfort, but to the financial security, happiness, family goals, comfort of others. And just for a moment, imagine with me a church where each individual valued others above self. There'd be no loneliness as people value those outside of their friend groups. There'd be no cliques or divisions along lines of age or ethnicity or popularity as different groups within the church serve one another in, in, in formal or informal ways. There'd be no one struggling financially in the wake of COVID-19 as wealthier members of the church look after poorer members. There'd be no need for anyone to pay a babysitter or get a random taxi to the hospital or celebrate their birthday on their own. There'd instead be a generosity of heart, an outward focus, a kind of go the extra mile attitude. That's an attractive picture of a church, isn't it? I'd want to be part of a church like that. And I'm encouraged actually at St. Andrew the Great by the ways in which I see that sort of thing in our church family. So what does it mean to be a team player in the household of God, in the family of God? Well, we've seen the how. Value the interests of others. Paul then moves on to the why. Follow the example of Christ. He is the why. Look at verse 5. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Or perhaps better, have this same mindset as in the mindset of humility because that was also the mindset of Christ. Now these verses, um, kind of 6 to 11, you'll see them in your Bible slightly indented. Uh, perhaps it was an early Christian hymn, something they used to sing. Perhaps it was something that Paul came up with himself. But it is full of beautiful truths about Jesus Christ. And, and you could have a sermon on pretty much every line in, this, um, in, in these verses. It's, there's some dense theological truths. Verse 6, 
in very nature God became, verse 7, the very nature of a servant found in human likeness. This is the heart of the mystery of the incarnation, how God became man. That song we sing at Christmas, very God, begotten, not created. It's right out of these verses. But Paul's aim is not just to inspire weighty tomes on what it would mean for God to become man. He's leveraging theology in the, in the service of practice. He wants it to be practical. And actually that's how all Christian life works. There's a motive, a deep motive, in what God is like and what he has done that cashes out in terms of action. And I appreciate this because the call to humility is hard. I feel like I need this kind of motivation when it comes to valuing others above self. And Paul says, okay, we'll look to Christ. Because Christ has this journey, this downward journey from divine status to slave status to no status and eventually is vindicated to ultimate status. We'll follow it through. Verse six, have the same mindset as Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, or, or in some translations, something to be grasped at. Jesus Christ is in very nature God. He is the eternal son of God. And he has with that all the privileges that come with the office. I was, um, something I learned in the last few months was that the prime minister gets access to a very nice house called Chequers, 16th century manor house somewhere in the countryside with like thousands of acres and stuff. Because um, you know, when Boris Johnson was ill um, and then kind of came out of hospital when he recovered, he spent a week at this place and there are all these pictures in the newspaper about this beautiful house and stuff. And you look at it and you think, wow, that is nice. Um, but there's something kind of appropriate about it as well, isn't there? Whatever you think of, of Boris, the, the kind of office of prime minister in this country, you think, yeah, fair enough, it's a hard job. Like, you can go and have a rest in that house if you want to. It's not yours, it's gonna be handed over to the next person. It's the appropriate thing that comes with the privilege. But in Jesus Christ, the thing that is most appropriate to him, he gives up. There's no self-promotion. Although he is God, instead of grabbing at or grasping after whatever is appropriate to that rank, he lets go of the privilege and makes himself nothing. Literally, verse seven, he empties himself. He goes from divine status to slave status. Verse seven, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. Now it is hard to imagine the shock of this line in the Roman world, in the city of Philippi. Slaves had no rights at all. And Philippi was a city that was very conscious, as I've said already, of rank and privilege. It was full of lots of soldiers. Soldiers kind of in the Roman army would be given citizenship once they kind of left the army. Um, but even in the army, slaves were not really allowed to serve. And if they did, they had to be in completely separate um, cohorts and stuff. There was this big divide between slaves and everybody else. Totally different category. You'd never mix with a slave. But Jesus Christ takes on the very nature of a slave in his human nature as he, as he comes to earth as a human. He goes from freedom to captivity, from luxury to poverty. But if that was shocking, what comes next is even more shocking. Verse eight, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Now we're used to the cross as a symbol of hope or you know kind of the emblem of Christianity or whatever but again in the Roman world the cross was the most shameful and humiliating thing that you could imagine. If you were in charge of the PR campaign for early Christianity you would just not pick the cross as a symbol for your religion. The um, Roman kind of thinker and writer Cicero talks about the cross like this. He says, it's a crime to bind a Roman citizen. To whip him is wickedness. To put him to death, it's like killing a parent. What shall I say of crucifying a Roman citizen? So guilty an action cannot by any possibility be adequately expressed by any name bad enough for it. Do you see what he's saying? There's just 
no words to describe how awful crucifixion is. Don't even go there. Don't, don't think about it. It's not worthy of thinking about. Jesus goes from slave status to no status. And, and by dying on a cross, it is revolutionary. I've been enjoying the book Dominion by the kind of um, non-Christian historian Tom Holland. And, and in it, he talks about the kind of history of Christianity and the influence Christianity has had on the kind of Western liberal values of our world today. And he says that this, this humility and the cross of Jesus Christ are so unique in the ancient world. There is literally nothing like it in Roman or Greek thought about humility. Sure, there's charity, but it is not the same as a self-giving, a, a serving, a becoming low so that others might be lifted up. Which, by the way, if you're a Christian, means that if you do want to love others, if you see something good about the virtue of humility in the world around us, well, Jesus Christ invented that. If you want to get better at loving others in your life, look at him. He goes from divine status to slave status to no status, and then is lifted up to ultimate status. Look at verse 9 and 11. God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. There's a kind of pattern. I like to think of it like a Nike tick, you know, the, the brand Nike, like they, it kind of goes low and then Jesus is lifted up. Because he went low, he is lifted. Because of his exhaustion, he is exalted. Because of his suffering, he is brought to glory. Not the vain glory from earlier, but true glory. And one day, verse 11, every knee will bow and every person on earth will confess that this Jesus he is God. He is Lord. And what a Lord. Paul includes verses 5 to 11 because I think we're supposed to marvel at what Jesus has done for us and worship him. It's a call to everybody who's listening to this sermon, in fact the whole world, to bow the knee to this saviour God. But he also, I think, wants us to follow Jesus' example. And that's kind of where it fits into the context of what we've seen already. Here's Paul's point. It is on the cross, as Jesus takes the sin and the punishment for sin that we naturally deserve, where you really see just how low he goes for the interests of others. There are no limits to how much he values others, to how much he values us. He didn't give himself because we deserved it. He didn't give himself because he had anything to gain. In fact, he had everything to lose. And this is a huge motivation for us, isn't it? Jesus doesn't ask us to do anything he hasn't done himself for us. Selfish ambition, vain conceit. Those two cards are very hard to play when you have seen God himself on a cross. I don't know about you, if you want to be part of the kind of church that we were thinking about earlier, we must, which, which, which I do, I very much do, and I, I hope you do as well, we must follow the example of Christ. He is going to be the motivator, the kind of battery pack behind that kind of other-centred living. And wouldn't it be amazing if others looked, and, and we ourselves looked around at our church family and saw this kind of Jesus-like service and sacrifice and self-giving and saw behind it that kind of saviour too. Let me pray. Our loving Father, we marvel at what Jesus has done. Though he was in very nature God, he humbled himself to serve us. And Lord, we pray that as we seek and try to serve others as we try and value them above ourselves. We live lives of humility that you would fix in our eyes what Jesus has already done for us and help us to follow his example. In Jesus' name, amen.
We're going to sing again now a brilliant song in response to all that we've just seen from Philippians. We sang it last week, but we're going to sing it again because it fits so well with what we've just seen, that it's as we fix our eyes on Jesus and see all that he's done for us, uh, we are encouraged, galvanised, equipped uh, to live out in the same way for others, for his glory. Let's sing together. In my heart from R to R So that all may see I triumph Only through His power May Christ be end of our service but uh, you can stay around and hang out with people if you'd like to click on the after church coffee link that will appear on the screen and if you click there you'll be directed to a, a virtual hangout where you can see some friends or make some new ones if you're a visitor or a guest that is welcome to everyone a few things coming up in the next few weeks uh, next week is book sunday uh, so keep an eye out on your emails if you're a church member uh, for books that we'll be uh, selling and for book tokens for families and things like that. Um, another thing you might want to make use of is the mission section of the website. There's resources and things there that might help you uh, to share the gospel with your friends or neighbours or work colleagues. 
Um, or maybe you yourself um, are thinking, I'd like to know more. Well, you could look there uh, and see more information on the church website. Or if you wanted to and you wanted to know more um, about the Christian faith or might want to join a small group, do just email the church office and we will get back in touch with you as soon as possible. Hey, friends. You might have seen that a few weeks ago we put on an event called Confronting Christianity, a live YouTube and Facebook discussion and question time with the author Rebecca McLaughlin. We've got some more of these real lives, real hope events planned for the month of June. Each Monday night, we'll be interviewing a special guest and covering a whole bunch of issues. Things like sexuality. Can I trust the Gospels? What about depression? We're kicking off on the 1st of June with Professor John Lennox. John Lennox is Professor of Maths at University of Oxford. Um, he's debated Richard Dawkins live and he's written a book called Where is God in a Coronavirus World? There'll be a chance for you to ask your questions live and it promises to be a brilliant opportunity to invite friends, family members and others who are interested in exploring Christianity. We really hope you can join us and for some of these other Monday night events too. First of June, do make the most of that if you're able to. Well, I think that's all there is to say. I'm going to pray for us and then we can make the most of after church coffee after this. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you are so good and good to us, that in Jesus uh, you reveal your love to us, make it possible that we might come into that relationship with you, and but also model to us and make it possible for us to be like Jesus. Help us to fix our eyes on him this week, uh, again or perhaps even for the first time, and that as we do that we are enabled and equipped to love one another well. Amen. See you next week, if not before. I'm really thankful that church is so much more than this building, that we're people who can gather together even though we're not allowed in there. I'm thankful for video calls with my mum in Sydney. I'm thankful that I can read so that I can learn how to do video calls. I'm thankful for the NHS and all the workers who continue to do their job with cheerfulness. I'm thankful to be together with my family here at home. Um, to share our daily routine and not having to rush around. Uh, I'm glad that neither my husband nor I have had any accidents or falls. I'm thankful for the lovely weather and um, opportunities to get out and enjoy God's creation. I'm thankful for the sun, for the ability to go on bike rides and enjoy wonderful views like this one. I'm thankful for blue skies and technology to communicate with people in Nigeria. I'm thankful for time spent with my teenage boys. I'm thankful for random bursts of laughter with my children. I'm thankful for still getting to see the people in my morning group and helping to clear my fuzzy head when I don't know what to do about things. We're thankful for extra time in our Bibles, uh, both on our own and as a family in the day. I'm thankful for sunny days and a garden to play in. I'm thankful for food and Melissa's books, which have kept me sane.